Okay, so we're recording. So thanks everyone for joining us today. And it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, and that is Ekaterina Ilin, who is a fourth year PhD student at the Leibniz Institute for Astrophysics in Potsdam in Germany. And prior to starting her PhD, Ekaterina completed her bachelor's in physics at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, also in Germany. And at the Leibniz Institute for Astrophysics, Ekaterina works with Dr. Katja Poppenhager, who will be familiar with many of us at the CFA. And uh, Ekaterina is expecting to graduate in July of next year. And she mainly studies magnetic star planet interactions and the long-term effects of these on exoplanet habitability and stellar evolution. And today, the title of her talk is Magnetic Worlds, Flares as Messengers from Star Planet Systems. So Ekaterina, please take it away. Yeah, uh, thanks James for the introduction. I'm happy to be here today. I'm actually also happy to be in the right time zone for once. So I'm actually at the moment, I'm at the American Museum visiting. And yes, today, today's talk is about flares as messengers from star planet systems. I'm generally, I have been excited about flares for a couple of years now, as James just said. Um, but flares are not only interesting in their own right, but more and more so as the, the title says, as uh, highlighters, so to speak, of what is going on in star planet systems. So before we jump right in, I give a quick recap of how flares come about. So um, to produce flares, we need a stellar dynamo. We need a magnetic field. So in any star that has an outer convection zone or is fully convective, we have a combination of convection and differential rotation going on inside the star that produces large scale flows of plasma inside the star, which we know from basic physics is moving current, producing magnetic fields which in the case of a stellar dynamo have the interesting properties of being both persistent and variable on different time scales. So persistent over cosmic time scales of mega years and giga years and variable also on these time scales, but also on very short time scales, minutes to hours in the case of flares or for instance, decades in the case of stellar cycles. To produce flares, however, we need to get this magnetic field out of the star, which runs under the hashtag flux emergence. So we have these magnetic flux ropes buoyantly rise and emerge through the photosphere where they create sun and star spots. And then this little sketch on the right uh, depicts a, a coronal loop, which will then move around on the stellar surface. So by the random movements of these food points on the photosphere, which will twist and turn energy into that magnetic configuration, which at some point destabilizes, then reconnection, so a reconfiguration of a magnetic field occurs, which suddenly releases energy, which then accelerates particles along the magnetic field lines down in down the from the corona to the photosphere and also up. Whatever is going upwards, and that is first of all the electromagnetic radiation coming from the flares, but also, as we know from the sun, flares are at least very large ones are associated with coronal mass ejections and energetic particle events. All those leave the star can potentially impact a planet. We can s summarize these three parts as uh, space weather in this talk. Okay, so this is, like a brief run through where flares come from and where they go. The reason I'm giving this talk are these three satellite missions, two of them already launched, Kepler and TESS, and one is yet to be um, shot into space in hopefully 2026. Um, two of these, I think, so the, the Kepler and TESS satellite, I think are the reason why I'm talking today about flares as messengers, because only since we have observed stars in on such long timescales in the optical heaven, do we know that 
basically every star with an outer convection indeed does flare before it has been difficult to monitor stars on such long time scales of weeks and even months. So, and we are not, so today we have a very large sample of flares to study, which is great, which also facilitates many of the things I'll be talking about in the next few minutes. Um, but the dashed line tells you that we are just here at this dashed vertical line and there's much more to come. So uh, exciting times ahead. So this is the sketch I'll be returning uh, to. So this quick nomenclature about what it is about, it's pretty obvious. So it's a star and a planet, uh, sort of a star spot and a magnetic field line. Okay. So this is where we'll be operating. I want to make four points today. You don't have to read through all of them now. I'll go over through them one by one. And they are meant to highlight the different areas where flares can be used as messengers um, from these star planet systems and the processes that are occurring in these systems. So take the first one. Stellar flares take kind of multi-wavelength snapshots across the stellar atmosphere. And so in this little sketch, which is at the top of the magnetic field where a flare occurs and moving along the magnetic field line. So one study that I want to highlight here, which I really um, enjoyed, was um, by McGregor et al. and published this year. And it is, as the title says, a multi-wavelength snapshot um, using a flare. So you see first two simultaneous observations of one flare, in this case on Proxima Sen. These occur almost simultaneously. And now we know that the ALMA flare um, on top, so at millimeter wavelengths, potentially traces the flash phase of a flare, which occurs right at the reconnection side and when the particles move downward. The HST observations tra trace far EV and um, so transition region um, emission which is a bit lower down. They are almost simultaneous, telling us that this process is probably very rapid. And then shortly afterwards, we see the optical peak in TESS, which is surprisingly very weak compared to the, other, to the far UV one. But it is also delayed, telling us that it is also happening later, so this is the thermal heating that builds up. And even later, you get the chromospheric um, heating, which is even more gentle and then occurs here, as you, see, as you can see, like in H alpha as a mild peak, like a, an extended peak um, at later times. So using these multi-wavelength observations, we can see that we can probe different layers of the, of the atmosphere by sort of transporting energy along all those layers. And at least the authors say, and I do most part agree, that the similarities to solar flares are striking. And they are for many aspects of flares. So that already here in this first example, it becomes obvious that any difference that we might see in the details of these observations tell us something about the differences between the conditions in the stellar atmosphere and the solar atmosphere. For instance, one thing that yet needs an explanation is that the millimeter, um, the, the radio spectrum of that flare has um, a very different slope from the one typically observed in solar flares. So this is where we like the, the actual site of the flare. Now we can go back to sort of the, um, the roots of it all. And you have to picture um, the, the elephant under the hat here. So I, I had no good idea of how to picture the insides of the star here where the uh, flare energy comes from eventually. So to remind you, we need convection and rotation to produce magnetic fields. So 
Rotation is what drives a stellar dynamo to a large extent, which produces, depending on what this rotation looks like, a certain magnetic field configuration. This magnetic field configuration drives stellar activity, which then causes the star to lose mass, to lose angular momentum, whereby we cycle back to stellar rotation. So we lose mass, we lose stellar, we lose angular momentum, we lose rotation speed, which changes magnetic field configuration, et cetera, et cetera. So what flares can do in a relatively efficient manner by just analyzing large amounts of um, optical light curves from these satellite missions is to find a proxy for stellar mass loss and angular momentum loss via this loss of magnetic activity. So this is in this plot there's a lot going on, but I will try to walk you through it. So you have um, on the x-axis stellar rotation from fast to slow. The uncertainties on the data points are the 90 percent uh, 90 percentiles um, of the distribution because every data point is a sample of multiple stars combined together to get appropriate statistics. On the y-axis, we have flaring activity. So the higher up the data point is, the more active the star is, the more flares occur. So the first trend you see is a trend with um, mass. So we have the lower mass stars in the redder shades, or more on the left on the fast rotation of a saturated regime, and more of the higher mass stars on the right, the slow rotation, low flaring activity regime. The interesting part in this plot is that it is, so it is controlled for stellar rotation, it is controlled for flaring activity, but it is also controlled for stellar age because the flaring activity that we measure here, we measure in open clusters of which we know the age. So the different symbol, the different symbol size, not size, symbol types um, mark the different clusters. So, and you can look at this plot, I guess, for an hour, but the, interest, the most interesting part here is that there is like a saturated regime on top. And then suddenly at some point, activity drops by about an order of magnitude. And we couldn't, we can't trace this transition point for all stars just lacking the full time range. So we would, we would need like open clusters across like from zero age main sequence to giga years here, which we don't have with the current data. Um, but we can say that it seems like early M dwarfs, so this green um, circle, leave the saturated regime around pre CPH, which is consistent with uh, models, for instance, from John Stone at all, which has been published, I think, last year. So this is an interesting way in which you can indirectly measure this whole dynamo uh, process and its effects. But we can also do this more directly using flares, which I find pretty exciting via flux emergence. So we know that on the sun, flux emerges to create star spots around in the belt around the equator, roughly in 30 degrees latitude. But what I found in test data on rapidly rotating fully collective stars is that actually, if I look at these somewhat strangely looking events, I find that I can actually model them as flares that occur at relatively high latitudes while rotating in and out of view for us as the observers on the stellar surface. So you see in the top panel rotation as the orange line and the um, flare the flux of the star as a black line. And in the middle panel, you see what the actual flare, if we would look at it like from the top, from like directly along the line of sight over time would look like. And the red line is our model, which very nicely fits the observations. So using this light curve plus um, high resolution spectrum that we took to get the sign i to actually resolve the inclination of the stellar rotation axis, we can tell unambiguously the latitude of this flare and thereby so, sort of trace where the flux must have emerged and then 
um, in, went into the corona. So it is actually about 80 degrees. And this is again, consistent with models, for instance, um, done as work with, I think it was done at this institute by uh, yeah, Alan Weber and Browning, um, who worked especially on the flux emergence part of um, the process, um, seems consistent, but we have a relatively small sample yet to be really, really sure. So, um, so far for the insides of the star. Now we can go out and look back at the space weather part of um, flaring activity. So in our little picture, we are transporting energy from the star to the planet and looking at what this causes. And as the title over here says, flares have apparently both favorable and adverse effects on exoplanet habitability. So for context, things you probably know is that the habitable zones of m dwarfs lie really close to the host stars, so up to 1.2 AU. And as a comparison, Mercury's orbit is at 1.4 AU. Typically, flares have not only on the sun, but also on many m dwarfs, um, their main energy emitted, emitted at um, a 10 kilokelvin black body radiation, which peaks at about 300 nanometers, which is in the near UV, which is known to be biologically active as it suppresses photosynthesis, can damage DNA, which on the other hand can also be useful DNA damage, which is um, a question of um, the intensity. So regardless of this relatively ambiguous picture with respect to um, biological effects, we still have the XUV radiation, which is, has been studied to, um, and is now known to affect both the photochemistry of the star and to drive atmospheric escape. So uh, two examples that are uh, illustrative here is for TRAPPIST-1, which is a very actively flaring M8 dwarf, which has two planets in the habitable zone, or we've seen it before, Proxima Centauri, which has one planet in the habitable zone. And you see in the light curves that these stars flare pretty actively. I haven't talked about coronal mass ejections and energetic particles, while for, for instance, XUV radiation, which is optically thin, it doesn't matter on which latitude the flare emerges because it, you, it will be, there is no self shading effects to this. Um, if you have an ejection of particles, it has a preferential direction, at least on the sun. And if the same is true for other stars, um, stars like, the ones I show here, so these are the four ones where I could apply this method I introduced before to look, localize the flares, they are all at much higher latitudes than in the solar case. So the orange dash line in these three spheres is like the 30 degree latitude line, um, which is meant as the sort of maximum flare latitude on solar types, sort of solar twins. So if this is true and there is no deflection going on of coronal mass ejections, we are really ejected from high latitude stars that have planets that orbit around the rotational equator would look not like this, but sort of more like this. But there have been studies interestingly that say that there's a bi so indications of a bimodal distribution. So this remains to see if really all, like most plants can be put in an equatorial plane like I suggest in this picture. And now the last point, which is a little bit more out there, that's still out there, even though we have been trying to um, work on this topic for say at least like the last 20 years or so, is that flares can actually, could actually help us measure exoplanet magnetic fields, which to date, I know of no direct um, measurement or good estimate ex escape, except of course for the stars and all, uh, for planets in our solar system. So this can be done with 
star planet systems that indeed interact. So I'm drawing a magnetic field line that in, in fact connects the star to the planet. And um, this little energy blob is um, going to, to be introduced in a second. So uh, the model goes roughly like this. You have, this is a, a study of the Kepler 78 system, which is like a G dwarf with a very close in planet. And the idea is that the magnetic field of a planet is connected to that of the star, creating a foot point where the interaction occurs, which is similar to what we observe in the Jupiter IO system. So what we look for in terms of flares is a periodic occurrence of extra flares that are triggered by this interaction, by the fact that the planet channels energy into the system, which can trigger flares in that region. It could help us, in fact, measure magnetic fields of planets, because the power inter of the interaction is in different models with a different factor, somewhat scaling with the magnetic field of a planet. So there's one study uh, from 2015 that uh, found that a planet in a very centric orbit, um, when it came to periastron, emitted a very strong X-ray flare while it was very quiet outside of periastron. This could not have been seen again because it's difficult to study flares because they are a stochastic process and it's not clear whether this thing occurs every time. Um, but now we have a lot of flares in the optical and what I recently started working on is flares in all exoplanet hosts that were studied by Kepler and Tess, one of them being the most actively flaring planet host that I could find in all of the Kepler and Tess archives, and is predicted to have star planet interactions with its innermost planet Aeonid B. But we have found nothing to date, so I have to disappoint you on this one, but I'm still working on it. So I'm excited to see if we actually can work on the entire ensemble of star planet hosts. So to summarize, these are my four points and sort of the theme of uh, today's talk. And I'm happy now to take any questions that you have. Thanks very much, Ekaterina. That was a fascinating talk. Do we have any questions? If so, please raise your hand. Ah, George. George, did you have a question? We don't hear you at the moment, if you do. Oh, I'm sorry, I was on Okay, mute. now we hear you. Mm -hmm. Okay, a very nice presentation, uh, Katrina. And uh, one question I did have that relates to it, maybe you covered this and I didn't quite get it. Is there a quantitative relationship between the rotation um, rate of the, of the star itself and this uh, latitude that pushes the flares to, uh, toward the poles? So the number of flares for which we have um, a latitude is, I think, in total six, um, mm -hmm. including the sun. So uh, saying that summing overall flares that occur on the sun. So I don't think that there is um, a known relation, like an empirical relation. Mm -hmm. There is a relation between flux emergence, latitude, and rotation. As far as I know, I think it's in this Weber and Browning paper, um, but it has not been tested empirically. So that's what I hope to do in the future. <laughs> But is there, a, is there a theoretical reason to believe that this would, at least for the sign, would, uh, would, would rotation slowly uh, push the flares to the poles as opposed to rotating fast? And is the sign even, even known or at least theorized? So the sign is, the sign of this relation is the faster the rotation, the higher the latitude of the flare. 
and you can draw like a suggestive trend. Um, so if I plot my, I actually can show this. I have, um, so th this is the data. So I hope you can see this. Mm -hmm. um, so these are my four stars um, in the test study. The, there's a M5 and a K2 star that have been found flaring during uh, spectropolymetric observations and the sun. So there seems to be some decrease, um, but it's not clear if it would be that linear or if there would be like a sort of sudden drop like the one we see in other um, rotation related activity studies. Right, uh, thank you, Katerina. So Evgenia, do you wanna ask your question? Sure, hi, um, thanks so much for that talk. So I have so many questions actually, I'm gonna try to whittle it down just to one. Um, so for AUMIC, when you looked at the test flares, right? There must have been, they must have been all over the place, right? And this is really hard with M flaring M stars is to tease out the periodic signal from the planet from the star's intrinsic flaring. And this is something we've had a really hard time doing for M stars. We managed to do uh, rot um, orbital modulation in say calcium H and K, but of, of F and G and K stars, but the M stars just vary so much. It's really hard to tease out a significant signal, a statistically significant signal uh, repeatable from the planet. Um, so that's one challenge with the M stars. So have you looked yet at any larger stars, like other hotter stars that are less active intrinsically, but might show a periodic signal from the planet more easily? Yeah, I, I do have the data, but I have to still to run the analysis on this whole exoplanet set. But yeah, I have the Kepler data and they, I, I think, have a lot of G stars. So we'll be looking into that. You'll be, so that's part of your plan? Yes. Okay. Well, Ongoing sorry. work. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> um. It's the richness of data access. That's great. Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay. I think we will end there and switch to our second speaker. So thanks again, Mika Serena. Thanks again for having me. Thank you for all the questions. All right. So uh, I'm happy to introduce our second speaker. Uh, so our second speaker today is Laura Harbach, um, who is a PhD student at Imperial College London, uh, where she works with Dr. Uh, uh, Subhanjoy Mohanty and James Owen on the atmospheric escape of exoplanets, and uh, particularly focusing on non-thermal effects, which are the things that scare me the most. Um, but we do know that they're really important for understanding, you know, the evolution of super Earth and sub Neptune atmospheres. So really important stuff. Uh, and now today, Laura is going to tell us about the results of some 3D MHD simulations uh, of the effect of stellar winds on shaping the outflow of an escaping planetary atmosphere. So please take it away, Laura. Okay, thank you. That's great. Um, so uh, I'm, yeah, I'm Laura, and today I'm going to be talking about some work that I actually did uh, whilst I was visiting the CFA. Um, um, I was working with uh, several of the people, you can, you can see their names here, who are still at the CFA, and some who have re recently moved on to, to other places. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about a paper that we recently published, looking at the effects of the stellar wind on observations in Lyman Alpha, so uh, neutral hydrogen on um, an escaping uh, photoevaporating atmosphere and how that stellar wind interaction affects that. So just to give you a bit of um, background of what actually is photoevaporation for those of you less familiar. So stellar X-ray to ultraviolet radiation, which accompanies the stellar wind, heats the atmosphere of the planet. This allows the constituents to reach the escape velocity, and this can remove a significant fraction of the atmosphere or it can strip the atmosphere entirely. And um, as the, the stellar wind carries that X-ray to ultraviolet radiation, it's interesting to study the interaction between the stellar wind and the photoevaporating envelope of the planet. Um, to do this study, we actually used a representative system. So we used TRAPPIST-1. 
And we chose the system for, for a few reasons, mainly because it has an M dwarf star, but it also has um, seven orbiting planets, three or, or two-ish are in the habitable zone. And we chose to focus on um, TRAPPIST-1E -E, as it's the innermost habitable zone planet. And so the uh, effects of the stellar wind on its observational signatures are likely to be um, the strongest of the habitable zone planets. Um, the, the star itself is an NM8, so it's very active. And um, when I say we're, we're focusing on a TRAPPIST-1 system, as we're looking at um, neutral hydrogen, it's unlikely that that's actually the, the current uh, composition of TRAPPIST-1E's atmosphere. So it's more just a representative system of um, what the, the stellar wind is like at an orbit of TRAPPIST-1E if you've got a planet that's the, the size of TRAPPIST-1E. So the, one of the reasons that we, we're looking at TRAPPIST-1 is because it has an M dwarf star. And uh, this is just a plot showing you uh, stellar distance and stellar temperature. And for M dwarf stars, you can clearly see that the habitable zone is in very close proximity to the um, in, in, to the the star. And so that means that um, the stellar wind effects are likely to be very important and the environment is going to be very different to that, which we experience much further out at, say, Earth. The other reason for looking at M dwarf stars is because um, there's high levels of X-ray luminosity, which drives that photoevaporative outflow. Um, and this is, so this is a plot from Jackson et al, but there, there's several um, similar ones in the literature that you, you may have seen where, so this shows you the X-ray luminosity divided by the bolometric luminosity as a function of stellar age. And uh, these are different um, stellar types, but you can say that, um, sorry, the later types uh, are uh, higher up on this plot. And the important thing to take from this is this sort of regime here where you have high levels of X-ray radiation for, for long periods of time. So that tells us that M dwarfs remain highly active for around uh, 100 million years. And so they need to be able to um, retain their, their, the planets need to be able to withstand um, those kind of strong X-ray to ultraviolet radiation and the interaction with the stellar wind for, for long periods. Um, so this uh, photoevaporative process that we think has been um, is going on is going to um, has been uh, observed using the the traditional transit technique, which I'm sure you're familiar with. So when the planet transits in front of its host star, you see a drop in flux, and this space weather environment has important implications for these observational signatures, um, as we'll go on to show today. So um, this is a, a typical Lyman alpha, so the neutral hydrogen. Um, observation and this one's taken from Heinrich et al 2015 but there, there are several in the literature with different planets and um, it's also been done in, in different species as well so it's been done in helium and in metal lines such as oxygen but the most commonly done one is um, Blyman alpha which is what we're focusing on here and I think this this particular observation has some really nice key features um, easily highlighted in it. So uh, this is just a plot of flux as a function of uh, velocity along the line of sight. And you can see that the, there are average spectra for different um, points in the transit. And um, there are a few key features that I just want to explain on this. So the line center is um, strongly affected by absorption of neutral by neutral hydrogen in the, the interstellar medium and the Earth's geochronal emission. And so you can't actually see the line center. And this is quite interesting because if you've got an atmosphere undergoing photoevaporation, you expect it to be um, reaching velocities of around the sound speed, so 10 kilometers per second. Um, and that would actually be lost completely in this line center. So the fact that we see um, red and blue shifted velocities of around plus or minus 100 kilometers per second suggests that um, the sum of the process that's accelerating this, this neutral hydrogen. Um, and uh, one of the suggestions that, that we're going to go on to today is that that is actually the interaction with the stellar wind. So I'm going to go and talk to you now briefly about um, how we develop these Lyman alpha, um, synthetic Lyman alpha um, signatures, but I just want to point out some key features before I do. So the first one is that you have uh, red and blue shifted peaks at around plus or minus 100 kilometers per second. Then the second one is that you have um, differences in flux, so you have a drop of around 50% for these ones here. And this one is obviously much less. Um, and the, the other one is that this varies substantially um, as a function of time. So when you look at different observations, you'll see that there's the strong variation in this observational signature, it's not constant. So these are the three things that we wanna be able to explain with our synthetic observations. 
So, um, yes, yeah, so this is just comparing the outer transit and the in transit lines. So in order to build our, our synthetic observations, we actually use MHD magnetohydrodynamic simulations of um, the interaction between the, the stellar wind and the planet's outflow. And we use the Space Weather Modeling Framework, SWMF. Um, and in particular, we use a part of that code called BATS-RS, for those who are familiar. This is a um, publicly available code that's been developed by collaborators at the University of Michigan. And it was originally designed for interactions in the, in the solar system, so um, modeling the, st uh, the solar wind itself and how that affects our own uh, magnetosphere. Um, but it has been used uh, a fair number of times now for um, exoplanet systems. And today I'm going to be focusing on two particular models um, that, that model two aspects of this interaction. The first one is the solar corona model. So this SC simulation um, models the, the stellar wind and the environment around the um, star itself. It solves the uh, non-ideal MHD equations in three dimensions. And uh, we allow the simulation to, to reach a steady state. And the uh, other simulation is the global magnetosphere simulation. So this is a completely uncoupled separate simulation. And we look at the, um, the effect of these stellar wind conditions on the magnetosphere in a, in a separate, separate GM simulation. Um, so just to give you an idea of the relative orientations that I'm talking about of our two simulations. So you have a uh, spherical domain, this SC, that is the model of the stellar wind. And uh, that's a three-dimensional simulation. And then um, you have on this plot here, I'm just showing you the orbital plane and the planet's orbit. And you can see that the second um, simulation is, a, it's, is inside the other one essentially, but they're completely uncoupled. And what we do is we extract the stellar wind conditions from the SC simulation, and then we use them as a boundary condition in this global magnetosphere simulation. And so effectively you see the stellar wind um, flow through the planet, uh, through the domain past the planet, and we look at the impact that has on the outflow. So I'm just going to briefly talk about the, the stellar wind model that we used, which is based on Garafo SL 2017. Um, and that stellar wind model is driven using a proxy stellar magnetogram. So we use the magnetogram, um, the ob observed Zeeman Doppler imaged um, magnetogram from GJ3622 which um, is a, a dipolar structure, which you can see here. Um, and uh, we use a, an average magnetic field strength of 600 Gauss, and that's because they have similar stellar properties. So that gives us an overall model of the stellar wind, which is what I'm showing you here. So um, this is a spherical simulation, but I'm only showing a slice through that domain, and that's this red circle that you can see here. So that's in the sort of X, Y plane, and that's colored by um, stellar radial um, velocity. And um, you can see the planet's orbits in purple uh, for TRAPPIST-1E. And what you can see from this is that um, magnetogram produces this uh, very interesting stellar wind structure, which um, shows that the planet experiences some very different stellar wind conditions throughout its orbit. And um, this big gray opaque surface that you can see here is the alphan surface. So this is when the alphanic Mach number is equal to one. Um, and that just tells you the transition between the two different stellar wind conditions. So inside the, the alphan surface, it's, it's, it's experiencing subalphanic wind conditions. And then when it passes briefly outside of the alphan surface twice, then it's experiencing superalphanic stellar wind conditions. And if you're not quite sure what I mean by this, then just think of it as being analogous to uh, sub and supersonic uh, wind speeds. So um, the, the two things to take from this are that the stellar wind conditions vary substantially and that they're much more extreme than in our own solar system. So you can already see from these uh, 1,200 kilometer per second radial wind speeds that this is much more in, um, significant than in the solar system where the solar wind reaches you know, between 400 and say 600 kilometers per second. And this has an important impact on the planets itself. So what we do is we look at the, the pressure at the planet's orbit. So this is the, the pressure normalized to Earth pressure as a function of orbital phase. And then each of these different um, data points correspond to the different TRAPPIST-1 planets. And you can see TRAPPIST-1E is shown by this sort of green teal color. Um, and you can see that throughout its orbit, it experiences 10 to the four times 
the pressure we experience at Earth. So the stellar wind environment around these M dwarf stars that these habitable zone planets are experiencing is substantially different to what we experience in the solar system. Um, not only is the, the stellar wind condition varying as it passes in and out of the alpha surface, so you can see that it's reaching uh, the super alpha uh, regime in this sort of um, point in the, in the orbit, but um, the stellar wind conditions actually vary themselves. So this is a plot of magnetic field strength, radial velocity and number density throughout the orbit again. And what you can see is that um, these, these sharp drops, these sharp peaks correspond to the, the super alphanic regime. And then these uh, intermittent regimes here and here and here are the sub alphanic stellar wind conditions. And if you just compare, say, two different stellar um, subsonic points, so for example, one and two here, you can see that the, uh, the radial velocity, for example, and the number density that they experience is going to be different. Um, you can also do the same for a transition case, so that's when it's, it's going between sub and super alphanic. And then a fourth case would be the, um, the, the super alphanic wind, wind regime itself. So these are four representative system, types of stellar wind conditions that the planet will experience throughout its orbit. As you can see from this, there, there is considerable variation throughout the orbit, but I think these four stellar wind conditions nicely highlight um, some of the, the differences and similarities in, in those um, the planetary magnetospheres that they, they cause. So the, the key thing to take from this is that the stellar wind model shows that the stellar winds are harsh surrounding the planet and that they vary substantially throughout the orbit. And so we're just going to focus on those four stellar wind conditions now. And the um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about the, um, the, the simulation that we did of the region surrounding the planet itself, so this global magnetosphere simulation. So as I said before, you um, set the boundary condition using those stellar wind conditions that I just talked about. And then the planet is set up to have a, a photo evaporating outflow that's exactly the same in all four simulations. So our planet has a magnetic field strength of 0.3 Gauss, and this is just based on a typical Earth-like magnetic field strength. We use a temperature of 10 to the 4K, and that's based on um, photo, um, photo evaporation models that say um, it should reach photoionization temperatures of around 10 to the 4 kilometers, uh, Kelvin. And so that gives us a velocity of around 10 kilometers per second for that escaping um, wind. The, um, using, the, that, um, using that uh, velocity, using the planet's radius, and um, values for the mass loss rate expected for this kind of planet, we can then work out what the density should be at the base of our outflow. So by, by setting both the um, wind speed and the density in our simulation, we're able to, to model our planet to have a photo evaporating outflow that's that has a mass loss rate that's consistent with, with the literature. So these are the, the four results that we have from those global magnetosphere simulations. So I know these are a little bit complicated, so I'm just going to talk you three, through them. So again, these are three-dimensional cuboid simulations. And again, we've taken a slice through the simulation. So in this case, it's in the orbital plane and the XY plane, that is. Um, and it's colored by number density when you can see the scale down here. In all four of these simulations, the star is located at the positive X direction, so the stellar wind is coming in in this kind of direction. And that's kind of obvious to see in the sort of case four where you get the traditional bow shock structure. And then um, the pink surface is the, the planet's radius in each one of these simulations. The white lines are the magnetic fields for, field lines from the planet's surface. The blue lines are the magnetic field lines of the star. They just change color as they transition through that slice in the domain. And then the uh, black lines of arrows show you the velocity of the, um, uh, of the, the material at the atmospheres, at the planet's surface, so where that atmosphere is being dragged and advected to. And if you look at all four of these cases, so you've got the, the subalphanic cases, so the two top ones, and then you've got a transition case, and you've got the superalphanic case, what you can see is that the um, overall planetary magnetosphere is substantially different throughout all of them, and it's been strongly advected by the stellar wind conditions. And it's particularly interesting to note that in some of these cases, so for example, case one here, you actually have some planetary material um, in the positive X direction, so um, towards the star itself, so it hasn't been able to fully confine that um, escaping atmosphere. So 
the, the, the key thing to take from this is that um, the stellar wind can strongly affect the planetary outflow, which results in a diverse range of planetary magnetospheres. Um, but so the next interesting question to ask is, well, what does this look like if you observe these four different cases? So we did a very simplistic Lyman alpha um, observation. So we used, uh, 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 we did a monochromatic relative intensity calculation. So um, for to do that, obviously you want the optical depth and therefore you want the uh, neutral column uh, height. And so to do that, we integrated along the line of sight. So we assumed we have this kind of orientation shown in the bottom right here, where the planet is in front of the star and you're, you're looking at the two of them there. Um, so effectively we're integrating and collapsing along that X direction. And so you end up with num number density profiles or density profiles that look like um, these ones shown here in, in the four cases. So obviously it's important to note here that these profiles will depend on the line of sight that you're assuming, but because we just assumed one line of sight, they, this is what they look like in our four cases. So then we actually produced a simple um, Lyman alpha um, gray model so this is a solar dynamics um, observatory chromospheric emission disk. And you can see that the, the planet transits in front of the star. And if I just pause it there, you can see that in all four cases, um, what it's going to look like is going to be substantially different because of the way that outflow has been advected by the stellar wind. So if we just take a, a look now at the, um, what this does to the relative intensity, so you can see uh, these different lines correspond to the different transits for the different stellar wind conditions. Um, so the gray case is no outflow. So that's multiplied by 10, just so you can see it a bit more clearly. And then you can see that for each of them, they have different um, transit depths, but they're also shifted in different directions. And so this led us to think, well, let's do a slightly more complicated um, rotative transfer process. Let's take into account that uh, the velocity dependence along the line of sight and try and reproduce those observational signatures in Lyman alpha. So that's what you're looking at here. So this is again the same four cases that I was talking about before. And so you've got flux density versus line of sight velocity. And each one of these lines corresponds to a transit signature, a point in the, in the, the transit time in kiloseconds. But it's easier if you just focus on these mid transit lines, these red dashed lines. And you can see that in all four cases, we're able to reproduce the, the observed um, Lyman alpha signatures. So um, by that, what I mean is that we get velocities that are around plus or minus 100 kilometers per second, which is typical. Then you also get um, asymmetries in the, the red and blue shifted peaks. So you get a different drop in flux. And then the, the third imp uh, important thing is that you also get uh, a variation in time. So you can explain that, that time variation in the observed signatures. So um, I think this sort of shows you that um, the stellar wind can strongly affect the Lyman alpha observations. And um, indeed, when you observe in Lyman alpha, it's quite common to obviously stack these transits. And so one of the things that we were interested in is we were looking at how long does it take for these stellar wind conditions to change the planet's magnetosphere and therefore affect the observations. And we found that at a sort of lower limit, it's around an hour or two. And so this could be really important when you're stacking transits over a, a larger time cadence. So the, the key points to take from this are that we've shown that Lyman alpha observational signatures depend strongly on the local wind conditions and can be subject to considerable vari variation on time scales as short as an hour. And the observed variations in exoplanet Lyman alpha transit signatures could be explained by wind outflow interaction. And so I will just leave my uh, take home messages there and leave it for questions. Thank you, Laura, for that very thorough explanation. Um, are there any questions from the audience? I have one of my own, but I feel I should ask the audience first. Are there any questions for Laura? If not, um, I'll ask that, that one of the things that sort of popped into my mind as you're going through this, and that was with regards to the assumed magnetic field topology of the star itself. So if I like, if I think back to the Zeeman Doppler imaging papers I've seen, of particularly of low mass stars, anyway, uh, the sort of global magnetic field topologies don't necessarily look like a dipole. 
right? A lot of them have sort of weird like Toro components and, and very complex sort of topologies. And I'm, I'm wondering, perhaps you, you, you haven't done the calculation or perhaps you have, but if not, do you have a sort of intuition about how a more complex uh, stellar magnetic field topology would sort of change uh, the structure of the stellar wind and then consequently how it would interact with, a, with an escaping planet's atmosphere? Yeah, so it's something that um, Cecilia Graffa, who, who wrote the original paper on this, has sort of explored um, in some detail. So um, they looked at things like varying the average magnetic field strength, and they found that that wasn't a particularly important thing. Um, and they also looked at, you know, if you're using, say, um, an observational Zeeman Doppler image, or you're using a synthetic spectra um, observation, and what kind of impact that has. And obviously, um, there's some cases in the literature where people have done similar things as well. And obviously, you do get different stellar wind um, conditions. They do broadly all agree um, for, you know, when you're sort of scaling them to the right um, stellar type and things. Um, but obviously, that's going to, you know, if you're looking eventually in the, in the probably a little bit further in the future than now, then obviously that's going to be important for comparing to observations directly because you need to accurately know what those stellar wind conditions are going to be like. And so are, are those observations even accessible for, you know, in the systems for which we would have a close in called a sub Neptune for which you might expect to observe photo evaporation, not photo evaporation? An escaping atmosphere uh, in Lyman Alpha? Yeah, so it's not for, there isn't one for this system. I think there is one for Proxima, but I'm not 100% sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Yeah, it'd be really cool if we could get both those sets of observations and actually <clears throat> be able to inform your models on a per system basis. Okay, uh, Joan, please. Hi, thank you for the awesome talk. It's really exciting to um, think we could detect such a big signature due to uh, evaporating planets. Um, so in that context, uh, I was wondering whether you might be able to measure the composition of the atmosphere by combining Lyman alpha with maybe another UV diagnostic of some other element like oxygen or something else. Um, is that a potential, is that something that you might be able to do? I was just excited because the signature could be very large because the uh, part of the star that it's blocking is large. Um, is there a potential to do something like that? Um, I think yes. Um, you've kind of hit on an interesting point. Um, what I'm actually doing in my PhD research is um, trying to model photo evaporation using uh, more massive species. And I, I think that the, the photo evaporative models are probably not quite there yet for heavier species such as oxygen. So I think that would probably be one of the limitations in um, trying to combine different observations and trying to understand um, the atmospheric composition. But I, I think it's certainly something that with the next generation of telescopes would be an interesting line of um, research, definitely. Thanks. Uh, Virginia. Yes. Hi, Laura. Thank you. Two such great talks you guys scheduled today. Thanks, Ryan and James. Um, so here's a question about the repeatability of the transits. Now, I'm not 100% up on um, the exact number of transits we've detected of the Lyman Alpha for GJ436b. Do you know what the latest on that is and what the repeatability of that Lyman Alpha it has a very deep transit, right? Like a 50% transit. Mm -hmm. um, and it must be visited multiple times. Do you know what the stability of that signature is? I can't remember off the top of my head, I'm afraid, no. I don't know if anyone else here knows, but it'd be interesting to compare that with the variability of the wind that you're predicting. Um, and of course, taking into consideration the different stellar types and so on. And so I'm, I'm wondering if say, would you say that the wind off of M stars would be more constant perhaps than the wind off of G stars? Wind off of M. Um, I think that's, um, I don't know, to be honest. Um, I don't know either. I'm totally yeah. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, I'm just I wouldn't wondering. want to hazard a guess. I don't know if there's anyone else who, who feels more qualified to answer that than I would. 
I'm not qualified to answer that, but I wanted, I was wondering whether, just to kind of riff off of what Virginia said, whether even before you did your calculations about what the uh, other species might look like, would it be useful to look at plausible uh, evaporative wind signatures from other elements? If you have the time series to see this Lyman alpha thing, uh, are there time series for other potential atmosphere species, you know, uh, oxygen or whatever, that you could look just to see whether the, the signature you see in Lyman alpha makes sense when combined with these other diagnostics, you know, kind of like to show that, oh, it must be an atmosphere and not something else. Yeah, I think the issue with that is that there's not that many uh, observations in the, in the metal lines and things. So I think having enough um, where you were happy with the, the time cadence and it being the same system and things, I think is probably a bit beyond the limit at the moment. Got it, thanks. Okay. Well, if there are no other questions for our speakers, then we should thank them again. <laughs> for two great talks. And uh, thank you to all of you for attending. Uh, I will just remind you before you take off that the next EPL uh, seminar is going to be next week, not two weeks from now. It's next Tuesday, same time, same place. So we will see you all then. All right. Uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoons and uh, evenings, Laura.